Okay, good morning. Welcome to our third SEND Community of Practice meeting and thank you all for attending. We do have ask you to be on mute whilst we are speaking. There will be opportunity for questions. You can use the raise hand function. You can physically raise your hand if we can see you. Um, you may use the chat to ask questions. We will have uh, people monitoring the chat, so please feel free um, to put questions in there. If you really have a question as we're going through the um, various speakers, Again, please feel free to just um, ask to, to stop and ask a question if you need to. As always, um, we have our four themes that um, we will what that we cover in this meeting. The first one generating, sorry, Claire, can you move to the next um, slide, please? Thank you. In our agenda today, uh, we will be hearing from ASK about apprenticeships, we'll be hearing from Leicester Tigers about traineeships and we'll be hearing from North West South Leicestershire College about T-levels and then we'll be hearing from Laura about LMI which is a really interesting bit at the end. Next slide Claire. And here are our four themes that I was mentioning earlier. So just a reminder, removing barriers for work experience and engaging in the workplace, parental engagement and youth advocacy, transition support and resource recommendation. We'll try to leave a little bit of space at the end so that um, everyone has an opportunity to either share information that they have, to share services that they have, and to talk about anything that they think or feel will be useful for others on this call. Um, in case any of you are unaware, this is quite an open forum, so we have representation from all stakeholders. So there are um, parents, uh, people from services and providers, teachers and employers, there's people like us on the line, uh, so that it's a wide audience for you today. So without um, delaying too much, we do we have Tina already joined us, who's going to be the first speaker of the day? I am indeed, I'm already online. <laughs> Great, so if I can pass over to Tina Patel uh, from Ask and Workpace. Tina, if you've got a presentation that you want to show, then you can just share it um, um, as soon as you like. Brilliant, thank you. I am just going to share. Can everybody see that? Yes, that's great. So over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting us in today, um, the ASP programme in today to talk about apprenticeships. I may have met some of you before around um, the ASP programme coming into the schools to deliver sessions. Um, I know that Laura, um, we're working together on the SEN school provision, but I'm here to talk about apprenticeships then. And again, like um, if you've got any questions, please let me know and we're happy to take them. So. Just going back to what are apprenticeships then? You probably already know this, that yes, an apprenticeship is, again, what I always say is a full-time job. Um, you It's split between 80 and 20%, so 80% of the, the time you're with the employer and 20% of the job um, is the training, that on-the-job learning. Um, I always say, you know, see it as a full-time job because, again, you know, you are employed, you get a contract of employment and, again, you're paid a salary. And because this is an employer-led scheme, they determine the salary that they want to pay also determines the occupation and the level of apprenticeship you're going into so that pay is very varied always say to um, students and teachers or any of those of you who are supporting students do your research early because a lot of employers pay a lot more than that hourly rate as well as four pound thirty now equally um, as your age and experiences goes up with an apprenticeship so does that salary range as well so an apprenticeship can last anything up to one to four years, again, depending on the level of apprenticeship you're doing. Um, and I'll talk about the levels on the next slide. But there are 600 standards that have been introduced and there's more and more and it's a growing platform. Um, employers are seeing apprenticeships as a viable option to take because for them, what's in it for them? They're getting a young student um, in from school. They're getting them to learn from the current workforce, gain their knowledge, gain their skills, but also seeing them as an opportunity to be able to bring in fresh ideas. And again, they want to see that person take that organisation forward. So 
again, if they're paying for the qualifications as well, these are qualifications that have been written by the apprenticeship service. So um, it may be the Institute of Apprenticeships, but the employer. So it's exactly what the employer is looking for. So there are more and more standards that are being introduced. And again, these standards are what that employer has to work by. So there is that negative stigma attached around apprenticeships that the um, student's not going to get a chance to progress. The qualifications are not going to mean anything. A lot has changed in the world of apprenticeships. Government have made a lot of changes, holding the employer more accountable for the apprenticeship that they deliver. So again, these standards monitor that as well. Um, you can do an apprenticeship right the way from intermediate level, right the way from getting a master's. So, um, you know, it is a progressive route for a young person. And again, real job with real responsibilities. And I think that really dispels from the myths surrounded apprenticeships. It's making teas and coffees, you're photocopying. You've probably heard that along the way somewhere, but that's not true. You're given responsibilities within your contract of employment, which is signed. It tells you what your roles and responsibilities are going to be. It's also um, about your study elements as well. What's that going to cover? What's that qualification and what's that progression route? But like we say all the time, it may not be the easy option sometimes for young students because they just come in straight out of school. They're used to just studying, but there is support available to these young students. So not just through the workplace where they might put them together with other apprentices. It might be they do a buddy and mentor system, but there is support available. And then on the training and the qualification element, the 20 percent of the job, they'll have an assessor. And that assessor that will act as their tutor, so again, can have conversations with that young person to see that they're travelling OK and do they need extra support? Are they managing that study and um, um, working element of the apprenticeship? Is there any challenges? But again, you know, the 20 percent of the job learning really does come from the workplace. Um, I know it's, um, you know, sometimes some uh, um, employers opt for a college, a day in the college, but it's what you're learning on that hands on every day in the role. And that's where you apply it to your 20 percent of the job. And again, it's observations and assessor will come in and do observations whilst that young person is doing the apprenticeship just to a to see if they are learning and they are meeting the standards, but equally just making sure that there are no barriers. So they are supported when it comes to the route of apprenticeships. So the different levels of apprenticeships then, as you can see on the screen, so you've got your intermediate apprenticeship, which is at level two, equivalent to five GCSEs. You've got your advanced apprenticeship, which is at level three, equivalent to your two A levels or a level three diploma. A higher apprenticeship is level four and five, and that's equivalent to a foundation degree. Levels four, five and six combined is your degree. Levels four, five, six and seven is actually a master's. So again, students can start onto the immediate apprenticeship and work the way right through to getting a degree. Now to start an apprenticeship, then you need to complete year 11 and be 16 years of age to start an apprenticeship. I often find you do have year 11 students that are keen to get into the world of work. They want to start earning some money, but getting qualifications as well. They may look at the intermediate, but you have students that think, well, if I do college or sixth form, I may have a look at the advanced or higher apprenticeship pathway because it's a better footing for their careers and their choices. So they might look at the advanced and higher. And again, um, I always say to students, the more effort that you put into that apprenticeship, and the employer sees how hard you're working, they might offer you progression, which could be the next level of apprenticeship. So it's always something to be mindful of. And then the other ultimate question I get asked, we get asked uh, when we deliver in skills is what are the grades that you need? This again is an employer led scheme, so they write, they will tell you what they're looking for in their application form. So it's not a standard set of grades, it's the, the occupation you're going into, it's the employer you're working for, which is why we always say to students, do your research early. For example, if you want to do engineering, you do need your maths and English and science. So again, it's worth doing the research early and having a look what's out there. So yes, um, just talking about apprenticeships and full time university then. So yes, you can get a youth degree whilst doing an apprenticeship. I think there's this stigma attached to the degree that you get when you do a degree apprenticeship is not the same value as one that you'd get straight from university. That's incorrect. It's exactly the same. It's still a bachelor's if it's a bachelor's that you're going for, but it's exactly the same degree. There's no lower value. 
Um, you are learning and you, as you're earning, um, like always, but degree apprenticeships are paid a salary and they are quite well paid. And I always say they're not always going to be at your doorstep either. Travelling is going to be um, a requirement. I mean, the employer does try to put the university where you'll be studying and obviously where, where you're working close together. But sometimes it's not the case of travelling um, and moving out is still an option for those young people. But the government and the employer are co-funding the degree, which means the degree is fully paid for that young person. So they come out with a degree that's fully paid for, so no student debt. But they are still affiliated with the university. They still get NUS discounts. They still can do all the social um, elements of being at university. That's not been taken away. But what does a degree apprenticeship give you? It gives you four to six years to um, do a degree apprenticeship because that's the duration because of part time studying. But it's the experience, the soft transferable skills that a young person will get, which is re really, really valuable. Um, again, it's beneficial for those students, and I'm not just saying this because I'm from here on behalf of National Apprenticeship Services, but when you think about a student going to university for three years and getting their degree, as a, um, a comparison to someone that's got a degree apprenticeship, um, that person with a degree apprenticeship could potentially be offered a full-time job. They've already got four to six years worth of this work experience under the belt, and they're actually in a good position, whereas those um, going straight to university may still have degree, um, the debt to pay back. They've still got to find work and they've still got to develop their soft skills. So it's a really um, a good pathway to take. Now, all the Russell Group of Universities offer the apprenticeship pathway. But one thing about degree apprenticeships is um, there's no flexibility in terms of what university a young person wants um, can attend. That is determined by the employer, unfortunately, because they, uh, with that university, are offering that package in its entirety. And then you're blocked release to university as well. So it could be up to two weeks or a bit longer of intense studying where you're sent away to the university to study. And you might be put up in a hotel, but all your out of pocket expenses are covered by the employer. A lot of it is self line and line managed training. So again, it can be quite intense, but you are supported throughout the with the work and through that study element. And the employer recognises as well, you do need to complete your degree. So you are allowed time to do that as well. So the range of apprenticeships then. So on the screen here, you can see a range of apprenticeships. Again, you know, it takes away from the traditional trades industry, your electricians, a lot more pathways to take. This is just a snapshot of some of the apprenticeship pathways. Again, these are on different levels, right the way, level two, right the way through to your degree apprenticeships. But if you go onto apprenticeships.gov.uk, there is a downloadable list of all the apprenticeship pathways you can take. Um, it's an A to Z list and you'll see a number in the circle next to it as well and that's really important because that's the level of apprenticeship you can do in that field. But it's also a good conversation starter with young people that may not know what they want to do. And the other thing we've got on apprenticeships.gov.uk under the influencer section is a resource called subject packs. Because often enough, if you're having conversations with a young person, they do say, well, I just don't know what I want to do, but my favourite subject is this. So there's been, we've developed a subject bundle which basically utilises 12 sub, uh, uh, popular subjects. And what we've done is transferred them into roles. So what roles would use that favourite subject? And then what organisations would use those roles as an apprenticeship pathway, a full time job? And it just makes that conversation easy and again it's for young people to identify what they want to do using their favourite subject and it's really good because sometimes you will often find they don't know that exists and I will say the Institute of Apprenticeships if there's one thing you take away from this presentation today is the Institute of Apprenticeship is the body that signs off all apprenticeship pathways there's a section called there called developing standards if there is an area or a pathway that you can't find an apprenticeship in have a look um, on the institute of apprenticeships because they sign they're the people that sign them off so you can type in what you're looking for they're also do trailblazers yeah sorry is your slide supposed to be moving we're still on the range of apprenticeships yeah sorry yeah i'm just talking about um the okay. range of apprenticeships. so um if you go on to um the national apprenticeship services if there's a um if there is a pathway you can't see national and uh, the institute of apprenticeships actually will have on their development standards when that pathway will be introduced and which employers are offering it so again you know it's a a pathway that you may want to think about and you can explore on the national, I mean, the Institute of Apprenticeships. 
And the next screen here, sorry, is just about the range of degree apprenticeships you can do as well. Just at a glance, um, a few to give you an idea of what apprenticeship pathways are available if you're doing it, if students are thinking of degree apprenticeships as well. And again, um, so often you'll find that go onto the university websites as well, because they will also tell you what pathways they have available for degree apprenticeships as well. Um, and then employers. So and what employers are offering the apprenticeship pathway. These are large organisations here that are offering the apprenticeship pathway. There are local companies in Leicester that do offer apprenticeships as well. I'm aware of that. And again, you've got your small to medium sized companies. And it's again just doing your research on findanapprenticeship.gov.uk, um, searching for what's out there. Um, in terms of the apprenticeship pathway. Um, we have seen an increase in apprenticeship vacancies at the moment. And um, obviously with COVID, you know, the numbers were low, but we are gradually seeing an increase in the number of vacancies across the whole, the different levels that I've been speaking about. And then what does an apprenticeship give you? So again, it's really, really important to, um, that you know students are aware it's developing these soft skills. So you're working, you're studying, you know, and but almost importantly, developing the soft skills that you're going to need to further progress yourself in the career of your choice. Um, on the screen here are the top most valued soft skills that employers talk about. It's what confidence, time management, self management skills, friendliness and manner, ambition, focus, common sense, situational awareness, enthusiasm, enthusiasm and optimism and empathy. And you'll see that the standards for apprenticeships also um, within the qualification element and the working element will focus on these soft skills. And again, what a way to put this on your CV if you're a, um, a young person is wants to move on from the apprenticeship that they're doing. And then I always get asked what how can I tell if an apprenticeship is um, good for that young person? The answer to this question is really personal to be fair it depends um, on the employer looking at is that employer a good place to work it's also about the young person as well but it's also I always get asked of the high in paid highest paid apprenticeships the ones that are good my um my answer to that is where are you going to progress from that look at those mid middle average range of apprenticeships um those you know you need to have a fair wage Again, what's the progression opportunities from that apprenticeship? Where is it going to take you? Is there a progression opportunity as well? And also, it's worth doing your research on that employer to, to see what they offer those students that's, um, that, that are doing an apprenticeship. Is it a permanent or fixed term position? Obviously, that will also determine if that apprenticeship is right for you because, you know, you want to be able to make sure that you have got something secure and in place. Most importantly, training providers. So we get asked often enough, how do we know the training provider is going to provide that support for that young person? Now, there is approved training provider list that Ofsted have got, so it's available on .gov.uk. You can actually put um, uh, the training provider name or you can actually search from the local area to find what training providers are um, and what, how good they are and how they're rated with Ofsted. I think that's really important. I mean, there is a lot more legalities in place for making sure training providers are providing a service that is fit and suitable for that young person. So it's worth having a look at that um, website. And then it's the role itself. Is it varied? Are you going to actually learn? Is it going to give you responsibilities? And, um, and are you going to do rotational learning? So those are the kind of things that you can um, tell if an apprenticeship is good whilst you're doing your research. Um, I'm just going to quickly touch on the AS programme and I'm happy to take questions. So um, if you're not aware of the AS programme, the AS programme is the Apprenticeship Support and Knowledge Programme for Schools and it's fully funded by the Department of Education. So we are across the whole of the Midlands and we offer various um, delivery styles in the schools. It's a free resource to schools. Um, anyone that wants support on apprenticeships, TA levels or traineeships, we offer that. So we do assemblies, we do a multitude of workshops, we upskill teachers, we do parent sessions. And again, as you can see on the screen here, we talk about apprenticeships, we talk about traineeships and T levels. We do um, workshops which um, 
starts from registering that student onto the um, apprenticeship.gov.uk. So right the way to supporting them to put in a su successful application. We do mock interviews, we do careers fairs, we do upskilling of teachers. So we've got lots of CPD events um, that we that take place and they cover lots of subjects as well as how to apply for an apprenticeship successfully. And then we look, do lots of parents and carers events as well. And again, you know, we support students from SEN schools, PRUs, your mainstream, FE colleges. We support them all and it is a free service to you all um, and so if you haven't utilized the AS program please get in touch and we will can get that into place for you we can make as many interventions in the schools as you want because we want to see those young people teachers and parents supported in those career choices and um, again how do we support stakeholders we work with very closely with the local authorities and the careers hubs um, we workpace is a training provider itself but we are an impartial service to workpace so we will provide that support we work with the leps job center plus schools advisors and we work very closely with local employers as well and local employers that take on apprentices because what we do is we try to get apprentices young people that are currently doing apprenticeships in the delivery at schools with us so that it gives it a more meaningful engagement with these young students that it's not just Tina talking about how excellent apprenticeships are but it's actually true so we do um, source out young apprentices to help with the delivery and the support and um, so I'm gonna leave this slide up so that's the apprenticeship.gov.uk site with a QR code um, but is there any questions from anybody at all? Hi Tina if we go through the questions from the chat and then anybody yeah. else feel free to put your hands up to get in the queue so the first one is from Sue Warwell um, all our students have learning difficulties it is our understanding that the government lowered the threshold to an entry level three qualification for students with an EHCP however our experience shows that training providers are not prepared to accept students working at this level is okay. that is that what you've experienced? Do you have, I mean, you went through quite a lot of this and we didn't see a lot of um, entry level uh, information there. So is this correct? Is this how it should be? Do, it what, shouldn't be like that. No, we shouldn't be. Training providers shouldn't be doing that. They should not be loaning, um, not supporting that young person in a career choice. So it'd be interesting to see which training providers are doing this. You probably don't want to share that information, but I can assure you that that's not the case. They are actually opening this provision so everyone is supported. So that's quite interesting. In my own experience, have I um, experienced this? Um, I'll be honest with you, I haven't. So that's quite interesting. And okay. I can find if, if this um, questions are in the chat, I'm happy to kind of further investigate that and send more information on to you. That would be great. Thank you. Yep. So we will we will pass that on. Um, second question from Gail Pringle. Can you do teaching via an apprenticeship? Yes, you can do a fully a full degree teaching apprenticeship. Um, it's available. It's on the Institute of Apprenticeships. It's also you can go on the findanapprenticeship.gov.uk site and have a look on there. Equally, you can just type in teaching apprenticeships um, in your local area on Google and you'll be able to find them there, but they are offered. Thank you. And um, Kuldeep's uh, comment and question is similar to Sue's um, in that it's about inclusive apprenticeships, what's happening yeah. in Leicester and Leicestershire. So any more information you can get that for that, that would be great. I mean, it is, we have had many people in previous uh, meetings also saying the same thing. So we know that in Leicester and Leicestershire, there is definitely a challenge around this, that okay. entry level is difficult. So if you can figure out what's happening or if there are any providers and employers yeah. who do offer that, that would be really good for us. And it's actually it's a really good time I'm at this meeting today because I am actually with ESFA tomorrow and okay. this feedback about inclusive apprenticeships I can table that and speak to them that actually I delivered this here today and one of the challenges in Leicester and Leicestershire is that inclusive apprenticeships is not so I can start that ball rolling and get get support and get some answers for you as well at the same time. Fantastic and then you know you're welcome to come and feedback at our next yeah. meeting um, if yeah. you'd like to. Um, Ian's just made a comment about um, ITPs being regulated. I don't think that's quite a question. And then Jamie said, is there a specific person that we need to ask for when trying to arrange, um, ask to come into school? Yep. It's a really good question. I'll put the next slide in there. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Fantastic. So Jenny Savory 
is the lady that takes the booking. She'll go through a short planning meeting with you, not a short, she'll go through a planning meeting with you to make sure she can understand the better the support you are want for your students. And then she'll book one of the Ask Ambassadors in to support. Right. I'm just going to apologise to those people who have been putting their hands up. They keep going down. By the time I go to look, I don't know who it is. So I'll continue with the questions in the chat. And then um, if anyone wants to put their hand up again, uh, feel free. I think I've got two again. OK. Um, so the next one in the chat was. So again, this is from an employer. Mary said training providers don't understand the requirement. I had to involve uh, Black Country Consortium as a provider didn't understand. So there is an issue with providers and Gareth, uh, thanks, providers should be making an adjustment with some really good case studies and one very local learner on LinkedIn that we could share. OK, Gareth, that'd be great. Thank you. We'll send that out if you can share it with us. Um, Marie, students without grade four in maths and English language at retake GCSEs at colleges. Is this the same with apprenticeships? Sorry, could you repeat that? Sorry. Sorry, students without grade four in maths and English language get to retake these GCSEs at college. Is that the same with an apprenticeship? So, yeah, so the if they don't get their maths and English, that will be embedded in their 20% off the job learning. OK. Um, Tony Bernard, please comment on the withdrawal of level two apprenticeships. I really can't make any comments about withdrawing on the level two apprenticeships. I'm sorry, but I will get ESFA to give me some uh, a, a message around that and I'll feed that back into you if that's OK. Great, thank you. I've got um, C Teal with hand up. I'm sorry, it, just, it doesn't tell me your full name. Would you want yeah. to unmute and speak? And yeah, hi. Um, yeah, it's Cheryl. Um, yeah, so so I'm, I'm in the meeting as a professional. Um, I'm a Senko in a secondary school. But the comment I just wanted to to make is from a personal point of view as well, in terms of um, you know employers uh, offering inclusive um, apprenticeships. Um, and I just wanted to to share that actually they are out there, but I think you've got to look really hard for them. Mm. And my son is is 23 and he's diagnosed with ADHD. So um, he actually had somebody with, at the job centre that worked with him to try and find employment and looked at apprenticeships. So job centres, I think it, it's worth noting, can can help on this as well. And he was successful in finding uh, an apprenticeship um, with a local company to train as a watchmaker, which has absolutely turned out amazing for him. So, you know, I think it is worth, you know, just particularly for 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 maybe people who are sort of in the early twenties as well, who maybe have been out of work for for a little while. Um, you know, it, be open with with the people at the job centre if they've got if they've got that. So, because there are services that can link in that can really help. If they hadn't found that for him, for example, I wouldn't have known anything about it, and I'm sure he wouldn't either. Um, so, I just wanted to share that that you know they are out there. But I think you you've got to utilise other people as well to find them and be reassured actually they can get them um, as well. But you know he's it's absolutely fantastic. You know the one that he's been accepted on. Um, you know, can't can't actually fault the, the employer at all, um, which is quite a high profile ju uh, jewellers, which is in Leicester um, and a couple of other branches elsewhere. OK, that's thanks. all I wanted to say, really. Oh, thanks for sharing that, Cheryl. If you're happy to um, share it wider, we'd be keen to hear more about that and um, possibly put yeah. together a little bit of a showcase. Um, yeah, well, it's with, it's with have... Pragnall. It's with Pragnall. Oh, so, perfect. They're really yeah, good. So it's really if um, I don't have your email address and I won't be able to probably won't be able to get it immediately off here. So if you can email um, any one of us at the LEP, we, we can pick that up with you. Yeah, sure. No problem. Thanks, okay. Cheryl. No worries. Gareth. Before I go back to the chat. Yeah, um, morning, everyone. Um, just by way of background, I've worked with a lot of training providers, but I used to work for the ESFA. Um, mm -hmm. The issue around level two that came up, Sahira, um, essentially, the rationale for it is they believe that a lot of their jobs and it's not the ESFA, it's the employers around the trailblazers. They believe a lot of the jobs at level two don't require 20 percent off the job training to be able to do those jobs. So they think for pe they're more suited the training at level two to people further from the labour market. So it should be done in more of a college setting with work experience as part of it. Um, so um, 
they are looking at the moment at a couple of exceptions to that. Um, the NHS have kicked off in a big way and are looking at a level two pathway for people further from the labour market where they may need supported employment or other support. Um, and for some of their administration roles, they claim that they are quite complex, even though they would still be a level two. Um, so I think we'll see some movement in it, but it's going to be quite some way off yet, I think. At least it's positive. Yeah, um, gradual, very there slow. There are conversations happening around this, and I know Tina says she's going to go back and have a conversation too, mm -hmm. so that's great. Um, next, in, thanks Gareth. Next in the chat, we've got Kerry Reeve. How do we access subject bundles, Tina? So on, on that previous slide, if you go on to where it says inspire and influence, they should be linked on there. If they're not linked on there, you can go on to amazing apprenticeships, click on the resources section, you'll see subject bundles and they're there as well. OK, thank you. Um, yes, you'll all be getting the slides afterwards and any information and resources that have been shared. So um, that will be fine. Keely Windrum, do they have to do maths and English? Lots of mine are exempt or not making continual progress. So it's worth having a conversation with the employer. They will. They are quite, you know, in the application form of an apprenticeship, you'll see desired skills. And it, it, it does, it's quite soft. It doesn't say you've got to have math and English as long as that young person is willing to do that in the 20% of the job. Um, a lot of the application forms, if you see, it's they have the desired skills and that in there you'll see they're not actually looking for the maths and English. They'll build up on that. That's why I say have a look, have an honest conversation with the employer because then they can help as well. Yeah, and just to answer that question as well, Ian Cooper has answered um, in the chat, if students already have grade four or above, they are exempt uh, from English and maths and should be embedded within the qualification regardless. Jeremy Pywell has asked, how are the new T-level qualifications being considered within entry requirements for entering apprenticeships? Um, so the T levels are for the higher and attainable students. So with a progression from a T level, will could be could be an apprenticeship. So they do count towards um, the entry entry into an apprenticeship. It really does depend on what you're going into as well. Okay, and of course um, we've got North uh, NWSLC later who will uh, talk through some that a little, T levels a little bit more. Um, so I think in terms of questions, one more we've got, what does quality control look like for employers? And then we've got a couple of minutes to, yes, Gareth, if you want to talk a bit more about the watchmaker apprentice. Um, I think Cheryl shared a fair bit, um, but if we've got a couple of minutes and Cheryl wants to continue to talk about that, that's absolutely fine. So uh, Tina, to you, what does quality control look like for employers as your last question? So um, for quality control, again, just like anything else, you know, with even the 20 percent of the job, Ofsted will monitor how that apprenticeship is um, doing. So again, they are regulated. So someone like the um, Institute of Apprenticeships will make sure that they are delivering. So how that work could be from an endpoint assessment. It could also be where someone comes in and looks and quality ch checks how that student has progressed, what work have they done, what criteria have they marked that work against, and it's an ongoing, sometimes, um, you know, you'll find that they will spontaneously go to the employer and say, right, what have you got to show that this is meeting the criteria or the standards that's been set for that apprenticeship? They are challenged now. Okay, great. So I think we're nearly due for our next guest. Gareth, when... Um... Go on, I was just going to say when Cheryl shares information about the um, apprentice, we, we can include you. But if you do you yeah, want to no, say something. Yeah, it's a quick point on the um, uh, the adjustments for allowing a, people to do apprenticeships without having to achieve level two maths and English. One of the big challenges training providers find is that learners turn up and they haven't got an EHC plan or any acceptable documentation by the audit requirements to make that adjustment. So the endpoint assessment organisations, the people who assess the apprenticeships um, and the training providers are unwilling to accept those learners until they can provide the documentation. 
or the evidence of that they need that um, adjustment and that might be um, a learning assessment um, done by a third party there's a number of ways they can do it but it is quite a challenge where people especially learners who may be dyslexic or had other difficulties and disabilities where they've had coping strategies in place through school maybe haven't wanted to go through a process of having it formally recognized then it can become a problem with the training provider to, to actually give them that support and put the right um, exemptions in place. So one of the things for young people especially is they may need to be coached through the process that they're going to have to go through an assessment and it's going to appear on their file but the result of that means that their uh, apprenticeship would be more accessible and they'd, they'd get exemptions or additional time in some cases for assessments. There's a number of adjustments that could be made as well. So um, that's one of the biggest challenges. So when some providers are turning people away, it may be that they're turning people away because they don't have the facilities or the experience of going through that process with a learner. So it is worth pushing back because you can always put a complaint in as well if you're not getting what you need. Thanks, Gareth. I think um, in summary, there is a lot has um, in in responses come up that we need to be speaking to the employers, speaking to the providers and looking a bit harder for those inclusive apprenticeships. But we've got Tina going away to with some of the questions um, and hopefully we'll get some answers back and be able to share that out with you or feedback at the next meeting. Uh, thanks for your contribution, Gareth. Tina, thank you very much for your presentation and for the information you've given and answering all those questions and being our first guest today. You're more than welcome. Our second guest today is Tilly Higgs from the Leicester Tigers. She's going to be talking about traineeships and um, I don't think I need to give her any more introduction. Tilly, do you want to share a presentation or are you happy just to talk? Um, I could just talk and then I've got a, um, a kind of information sheet. If you could share that round afterwards, Absolutely. that would be, yeah, be no great. Problem. Cool, thank you. Yeah, so I'm um, from the Lesser Tigers Foundation and I work in the inclusion team. So we work with young people 16 to 24 who um, are currently neat or have found themselves neat. Um, so we run a variety of programmes, but the one I'm coming to talk to you about today is our traineeship. So um, in January, we've piloted our first traineeship and I think we're on week eight currently. Um, so it's this has been kind of based in the stadium. So all of the work experience has been within the stadium, um, within match days, retail, ticket office, hospitality. Um, obviously, Leicester Tigers are doing quite well at the minute, so it's all been quite exciting. Um, but it's been like a really nice experience for the young people to be involved in. Um, but we are going to be running a second traineeship in May, um, starting on Tuesday, the 3rd of May. Um, and it will be a 12 week programme. So it runs to the middle of July um, and it's a programme essentially for 16 to 18 year olds predominantly. Um, 19 plus will be considered on a case by case basis. Um, but yeah, so it's going to be 12 weeks. Learners will have the chance to um, improve their functional skills up to a level two. Um, they'll also do multiple, um, a variety of kind of employability sessions, personal development sessions. Um, so there'll be things like sector specific sessions, but also, you know, CV writing, interview prep, communication, those sorts of things. Um, and then alongside that, we'll also do a BTEC level one award in sport. Um, and then also just kind of like enrichment things so obviously we're a sports foundation so we will do kind of like yesterday we went and played basketball but I should kind of say it's not it's not a sports program we do kind of keep sport involved in it just because I think it's really important for you know mental health and well-being but you know you don't have to be a sports performer we're sort of certainly not going to ask you to start playing rugby and start you know tackling each other and scrumming you know it's nothing like that it's more just for kind of well-being and a bit of enrichment um, and then other things we'll do kind of we'll bring people in for workshops um, and things like that. Um, so within, like I said, last the current traineeship we're running has all kind of been based within the stadium and match days. But obviously, as we get to the end of the season, that's not going to be an option. Um, so we're hoping and we are linking up with Leicester College and their apprenticeship team to kind of use it as the traineeship as a recruitment tool into their apprenticeships for 
September start. So obviously we'll finish mid July, then it will be summer and then you'd be ready to start your apprenticeship in the September. Um, so I've secured a couple of um, placements already, but I think for us, it's more important to meet the young person first, find out what they want to do, what they're interested in, and then work with um, Leicester College or other employers who kind of have links with to locate them um, a placement. Um, so they would do 70 hours work placement across the two, the 12 weeks. So that would obviously be it's like a minimum of 10 hours a week at least um, max. Um, so we're looking at maybe like two days. Um, we might up it if they're getting on really well. Um, but for us, I think it's really important that they have I've just seen a question come up that kind of what support do they get? So we link in with connections who will come in and um, will support the learners with their progression pathways. Two of our learners currently have been offered an apprenticeship within our hospitality um, section, which is amazing. And others are going to be offered kind of like retail match day support um, work. So it's really exciting. But I think for me, yeah, it's what what we're going to do afterwards to look after them. Um, but yeah, so we'll be linking in with connections who will have like a, a careers advisor to kind of support them and help them on to their progression. Obviously, if they want to be taken on as the apprentice in their area, then that's great. But I think it is really important. We're not just going to kind of drop them at the end of the 12 weeks and go by then. Like we are, we want to help them and make sure that they go on to something, whether that be actually they want to go back to college, they want to do an apprenticeship, they want to just get a, a job, you know, whatever it is, we're there to help them with that. Um, I think I've covered everything in terms of eligibility. Um, so, yeah, in terms of eligibility, you were looking at 16 to 18, but obviously 19 will be considered um, currently not in education, employment or training, um, have little to no work experience. Obviously, the traineeship is aimed at um, those that aren't quite ready for employment. So, yeah, those that have no experience um, and then also they can't have completed another traineeship or apprenticeship previously but they can have um, been qualified up to a level three in college and then become neat, um, if that makes sense. So it's a bit of a minefield with the eligibility, but um, yeah, basically someone that just maybe isn't quite ready to go into work and needs a 12 week programme to get them ready, get them into a routine on time, learn the basic skills, give them a bit of work experience, functional skills, and then hopefully after that, they'll be ready to move on into yeah into employment um so i think that's everything shall i just start answering the questions if yeah i mean i was going to go through but if you're happy to that's great yeah i don't mind so yeah done the 12 weeks one um so connections obviously just work with the city students but we will still support those that aren't so i guess yeah we can take county students as well we've got county students at the minute um but most to be honest, most of our students are city just because of kind of locality and transport. Um, so whilst connections can't support them, we can support them and we will support them and we'll find links for them with like through the LEP and everything like that. We will support them. Um, we do offer a study program, but I think currently as of next year, we're going to move to a traineeship model fully. Um, I think our study program because we're so close to Leicester College and we run all the same, they run exactly the same courses as we do. We found that it's not quite as popular. Um, so we're going to be running, I think, a traineeship model moving forwards. However, I will caveat that with we are going to be running a study programme over at Stevenson College yeah. in Colville in yeah. September, which will be very, very similar to a traineeship um, in that it's like a it's a 16 week employability programme. Um, Moral on Teams? No, no. And they'll do um, right. weeks work experience. Um, so yeah, very similar. Um, at connections, we only work with students who are resident in Leicester. Yeah. Um, so I think that's all the questions. I realise I've probably just babbled for a while. <laughs> so sorry about that. If anyone has any other questions, just um, just shout. No, that's that's a lot of information given um, very efficiently. <coughs> uh, we, thanks for Can answering all those questions in the chat. Um, sorry, Laurie, got a question? I was just going to say, so you said you had something to share afterwards for 
um, applying or more information about the traineeship. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'll send that to you guys, and that if you could share it with everyone, that'd be great. Um, and then, yeah, I should have said in terms of applying, um, it will be like an initial conversation. Get in touch with myself or my colleague Ryan. We'll get the young person down to the stadium, have an informal chat with them, show them round, kind of talk them through it, and then we go through the kind of eligibility criteria and those sorts of things. So it is very informal because I think we feel that if you have like a big formal process, it just puts people off especially the kind of people we're aiming to work with and support um so it's very informal very relaxed um so yeah the best way is just to make contact with myself or my colleague and our details are all on the um the information and the other thing i didn't say was that our education provider is a group called scl education um basically they work with a lot of sports clubs so they kind of they deliver the maths the english um that kind of support and they facilitate all of that and then we're so they're our education provider and we kind of do everything else if that makes sense yes um <laughs> thank you you've been very efficient and um you're in the middle of some delivery aren't you and you've just kind of popped out of there to come and speak yes. to us so an extra special thank you no um, i love this program i'm sure you're going to get inundated um with people because it is excellent and so yeah thank you very much and we'll let you get back if you need to go again okay, and if there are any more questions we'll direct them to you afterwards perfect thank you so much uh, thanks tilly bye bye guys Thank you everyone for being so patiently listening. I know we've got a lot at you today, um, but we will have opportunity to speak a bit more in a little while. Before we do that though, and to move on quickly enough, Alison Lath is on the call with us today, who is from Northwest South Leicestershire College. I'm sure many of you know her already. And she is up next with T-Levels. So Alison, are you ready? Would you like to share a presentation or just speak? Um. Thank you for having me, Sahira, and hello, everyone. So yes, my name's Alison Lauf. I'm the School's Marketing Officer at North Warwickshire and South Leicestershire College. And today we're going to be giving you a bit more information about T-Levels. And um, just as a start to note as well, I just wanted to make everyone aware that we do now have a new um, additional learning um, support manager as well, Stephen Bond. So it might be likely that he'll be in contact with a few of you as well, working with students and also the teams in our additional learning support side as well. But today I've actually been joined by Dawn Helsby, who is the NWSRC Student Employability Manager, but she is the newly appointed Vice Chair for the T-Level Ambassador Network as well. So hopefully we'll get some of those myth busting um, facts across to you today. And um, if you've got any questions, please pop them in the chat as well. Um, and we'll get those answered at the end of the presentation. So Dawn, are you there? Hi Ali, hi everyone. I'll just get the presentation up for you, Dawn. Thanks Ali, thanks for the introduction. It's great to uh, virtually meet everybody today. Thanks for having me. Okay, so welcome everybody. What we'd like to do is go through T-levels and discovering uh, their next steps, our young people's next steps at NWSRC. So what is a T-level? So North Warwickshire and South Leicestershire College are delivering T-levels from this September. They're an alternative practical route to an A-level. One T-level is equivalent to three A-levels. T-levels are very similar to our current level three vocational qualifications, which include an industry placement. So what we've currently done over the last three years is built in an industry placement to our current level three study programmes. And what that's allowed us to do is develop partnerships with our employers locally so that we're able to then have that commitment from those employers moving into when we start delivering T-levels in September. How to um, look at what a T-level is like, we know that it's very new, even though um, the first 54 colleges launched their first T-levels two years ago. So this year we'll see the first graduation of a T-level. Um, there is still some um, perhaps unsure, people are unsure about what a T-level is. Um, so you can kind of perhaps look at it as a, a reversed apprenticeship where they are 80% in the classroom and 20% on the job. 
Um, so what that allows is if you think some young people leave school and you've got some that are really ready for the workplace and, and can't wait to get in, um, do some on the job training with some slight classroom activity. Whereas we will get some young people that are still a little bit nervous around that. So actually what a T-level does is it allows them to have that more classroom activity, but being able to apply the skills, knowledge and behaviours in industry, but for 20 percent of the time. So what's the difference? T-levels have been designed with employers, businesses and providers. So that really allows for that skills gap to be bridged. So it's, it's being able to look at what skills do the young people need? What do employers need? And how are we being able to develop that into a programme? What students will need to do is complete 315 hours of an industry placement alongside their current alongside their T-level. So it's equivalent to around 45 days. The reason why it got changed to the 315 hours is all depends on the industry. So if you think maybe construction, they might start at seven o'clock in the morning, but they will work till maybe five. Um, so the reason why the hours was put in place is so that it made it more fair across how they were doing their placement. Some students may do more, um, all depending on as far into when they start their placement. The progression for any T level is that they will be able to have some progression options into either higher apprenticeships, full time employment, they can go on to higher education or they can go on to university. So we've got a short clip here. And um, this is for you to be. A oh, I don't think you can hear it. No, no sound, I don't think no sound at the moment. There's no sound. Um, that's just to give you an idea of perhaps the, the adverts that are coming out at the moment. You'll see a lot of different adverts on YouTube. You'll hear them on the radio. There's a specific theme tune in the background, which is quite quirky. Um, and they're being rolled out currently um, just so that young people get to see what this T-level is about and what the access into T-levels are. We can share a link to this if you can send it to us afterwards. Brilliant. Thank you. So what are the benefits of a T-level? So there's quite a few questions that were being asked on our open evenings, whether that's by parents or by the young people. So yes, you can go to university with a T-level. So all depending on what T-level the, the young person will do, all depends on how many UCAS points they will get, but it is an equivalent to three A-levels. So they will get UCAS points to be able to take them onto the university. Um, what we are saying to the to any pupils when Alison goes into any schools and she does um, our provision sharing in assemblies and talks about T levels is we are saying to anybody that if they're interested in a T level and their plan we know that plans change but their plan is to go into university we are saying to them please check your preferred universities that you want to go to first that they are accepting T-levels. There are a small amount that currently aren't, but the government are working with them um, and that will change over the next year. So what skills are needed to do a T-level? There are no skills required to do a T-level. You don't need to leave school with any specific skills to be able to do a T-level, but there are entry requirements. And with those entry requirements, originally the government had a standard now they are leaving the entry requirements for the colleges to, to actually set themselves. So um, they are quite high for a T-level, but that doesn't mean that nobody can do them because there are transition programmes available and there is additional support within the T-level once somebody's on there. Um, so there's no specific skills. There are entry requirements. What skills will the students gain when they're on a T-level? So. They've got two years when they're on this T-level. The first year is a core year. So they will really, if you think of um, a construction model, for example, they, they will have to do health and safety, manual handling. They may have to do their CSES card. So anything that you would need to do in on-site construction, um, regardless of what skill or specialism you want to go into, there will be a generic part of that training within the year one, which is called the core. Um, also part of that core, there will be dedicated industry placement advisors that also deliver a pre-placement program. And that focuses more on their confidence, their networking skills, their communication skills, so that they are ready to go into the placement with transferable skills, as well as an element of their core skill from their curriculum. 
Um, so certain skills and knowledges are gained within that first year. In the second year, that's when they really think about what specialism do they want to do before they go before they finish their qualification. And that's where their industry placement is really tailored. So in the second year of on-site construction, they would either go into a specialism of painting and decorating, um, carpentry, or I've forgotten the other one, Alison. <laughs> painting, painting and decorating. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So there, there is three different specialisms within that second year. Um, can you do a T-level if you have additional needs? Absolutely. So I explained earlier that there is a, a transition programme. So if for any reason entry requirements aren't met, there will be a transition programme. This year, the transition programme has been rolled out in our health and social care sector. So they're trialling the, the transition programme first. And then all of our other T-levels will have a, a transition programme in the years to come. Um, and what that does is that is based around how we get them ready and how we get those additional qualifications for them to be able to then get, be accepted onto the T-level. If entry requirements are met, then um, there is additional support for anybody with additional needs or an EHCP. And what I mean by that is, the dedicated industry placement advisor um, puts a separate plan together with somebody that's on an EHCP. So um, if, if, they've, if they've got certain um, support that they need, like a plan that's been put in place for one of our learners is they were really nervous about um, being around people. Um, so certain specific things are put in place where they were supported in how they draw money out, how would they book a train ticket, how would they get on the train, um, what do they do the other side when they get to their placement? So there were all these tiny steps that were put in place as part of a separate plan for their industry placement. And that dedicated industry placement advisor went through that whole journey with them until they built the confidence up to be able to do it themselves. Because sometimes it's those small steps that they've never done before. They've never got transport before. They've never gone to a workplace before. So we're able to put the additional hand-holding, nurturing side of it in place before they actually go into their placement and they start building that confidence up. Next slide, please, Alison. Thank you. So industry placement, how will the student be set up with their employer? So when they're actually at college, we already have employers that are committed to our T-level industry placements. And those employers in the first year of their T-level come in, they'll do site tours, they'll do guest speaker sessions, um, they'll do Q&As, and they'll do lots of networking with them to develop their confidence around that industry. Um, they will also set up mock interviews so that they're able to match the right student into the right placement. Um, and then our dedicated industry placement advisor works with employers and students to make sure that we're setting the right targets for them during their placement, which is linked to what they're studying at the college. So what support is there for placement? So I mentioned earlier about the industry placement advisor putting additional support plans in place. So if we have any learners with the HCPs, they will do a separate target plan with them that supports them with the, the other transport and transferring um, confidence building with them. How do students prepare for their placement? So at the beginning of the academic year, like I mentioned earlier within the core, they do what we call a pre-placement preparation plan. We call it the PPP. Um, and with that, they do all, they spend a full day a week with their industry placement advisor. And that is all around developing their softer skills and their employability skills. So it's all around how they communicate professionally, what are professional attitudes and behaviour, networking. It will include the guest speaker sessions and any site tours. Will the students get paid on a T-level? So a T-level placement is not paid. And this is where it's different to an apprenticeship. But how we see the T-level is it's a pipeline into apprenticeships, and that's how a lot of our organisations are working with us. So students don't have to get paid, but some of them do. It all depends on the organisation and it all depends what they want to put in place for their learner um, or that the, the employee that they take on for that placement. Um, however, we do have funding in place for them. So with a T-level, they will have support with um, being able to provide transport for them. So we pay for their transport during placement. Any food that they have on placement, that will be paid for. If they need any uniform or they need some tools or equipment, that is covered to support them while they're in placement. 
Thanks, Alison. So at Nuneaton campus, our T-levels from September, we will be launching the Business, Digital, Engineering and Health T-level. At Wigston, we'll be delivering the Childcare, Education and Digital T-level. A Harrowbrook campus will be an on-site construction T-level. So how do NWSLC have the support and the facilities in place? And that's all around enriching our students further. So, you know, how do we make their time more enriched when they're with us? So we do have funding and bursary support. So even if they're on a T-level, there is separate funding if they require a bursary alongside the funding they may get when they're having their expenses paid for. We've got a student centre with pool tables, table tennis, there's trips. Um, we've got our resource centre, which was originally the library, um, and that's all around digital, digital resources, books and further enrichment. So those are the clubs that will be going on in our resource centre as well. We have on-site counsellors. We appreciate the last two years have been really difficult for a lot of our learners. Um, so there is additional support where we've got our on-site counsellors. We've got some mental wellbeing clubs that are at each site um, that have the additional support there for any learners that are struggling with their mental health. We have dedicated employability coaches, and that's another team um, that I look after that um, work quite closely with the industry placement coordinators. Um, they do all of our personal development with the students. So all around everything that any schools that are on here, when you do your personal development programs, such as prevent healthy relationships, online safety. So they work with our students um, on all of the personal development aspects, topics as well. We've got hair and beauty salons and a gym. And all of that also counts to any enrichment or peep hours that they need to add up. And then we've got what everybody loves, which is the on-site Costa and Starbucks. How to apply. OK, so you can apply via our website. Alison, can I pass this over to you now? Yes, no, that's fine. Dawn. Brilliant, thank you. Thank so, you. so, yes, if you can apply through either your PS16 account, which um, if you are aware of PS16, you'll know what it is. If not, you can apply online or you can request paper um, formed applications. But also, um, I know a lot of you have mentioned as well that your students have EHCPs or additional needs. We can also book in meetings with our additional learning support team. Um, so the student and the parent as well can also have a chat to our team about what support we can put in place um, surrounding the application form. And normally it's quite nice to have those meetings prior to the application form being done. So we could host those and then obviously lead on to the actual application form as well. Whatever you feel is suitable for that particular student. We also have upcoming open events. So we're actually hosting an open event tonight at Hinkley and Wigston, but we do have some more up and coming in June as well. So we are hosting a lot of open events this year, um, obviously coming out of lockdown as well. We are very aware that students are very nervous about joining the college, but we're looking at doing a lot more transitional support as well. If you want any um, transitional support for your students, please um, get in contact with me. I'll drop my email address in and I'll put you in um, touch with the correct department um, so that we can get that organised for you as well. And finally, to end, uh, thank you so much for listening. Obviously, pop your questions in. We'll, we'll have a look through your questions now. But if you have any concerns, please email marketing at nwslc.ac.uk. Thanks, Alison. I have, have just noticed there is a couple of questions in the chat. So, Maria, do students find their own placement? If so, do they receive support with this? This is a really good question and we do get asked this. So we have committed employers. However, we also have students that may have an organisation in mind or it might be that it's a family business that they want to go and work in. Um, so we will take on board what is best for the learner. Um, so if the learner comes with their own placement, we absolutely, we absolutely will exactly, exactly the same. The same. So yeah. what we will do is we will go out to that employer organisation, have a chat with them, with that student, and then they will be supported exactly the same with their reviews on site, as well as any student would be if it was um, an organisation that we are currently working with. 
Uh, Ian's put something about additionally students can do virtual work experience as part of their T-levels. Yes, they can as part of their 35 hours. So the 315 hours, 35 hours can be used as what they call pre-placement activity. And that's what we include as part of our pre-placement preparation plan. So if there's anything virtual or any work experience, which helps them um, make their mind up and just gives them, you know, that that sort of additional information to be able to choose. Um, then, yes, that forms part of the 35 hours that they're able to do as part of their 315. Uh, if a learner doesn't find a placement, you definitely will find one for them. We have had students removed from T-level courses at other places because they haven't found a placement. Um, Absolutely. Um, th there's no way a T-level can happen without a placement. So what we've done as part of our what we call the capacity delivery fund. So that's what we've had for the last three years. That's where we've built the placement alongside the current study programme so that we're able to develop those partnerships with businesses already before the T-level starts. So while we are open minded to students that want to find their own, we have placements available. We won't, we, no student will be completing a T-level without an industry placement. If any more questions do come through with the chat or if anything comes through, you know, after you've perhaps slept on it, because we know sometimes things come a bit later, please do get in touch. I'm more than happy to answer any questions as well, Alison. And what I'll do is I'll put my email in the chat and then if anybody thinks of anything further over the next couple of weeks, then just drop me an email and I'll do my best to answer it as, a, as effectively as I can. Thanks, um, everybody. Oh, sorry, Alison. To um, add as well that if you do have lower entry level students that, you know, are very keen to kind of move on to apprenticeships or maybe T levels as well, we do have some more lower entry level qualifications that they can complete. So, for example, vocational, we do have our additional learning support team that are fantastic. And um, we also have our foundation learning course, which is more specialised. So those are students that are highly anxious or maybe have quite a few um, additional needs or maybe a disability as well. Um, they can join those and they actually move on to something called a supported internship, which actually has become so popular that we are now looking to expand on that as well. So please do get in contact with us if you do um, need any support. We have a wide range of um, courses for students, but also we have a lot of support for them as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn and Alison. Um, we will send out your details. It, anyone who hasn't uh, done a presentation, we will send out details of the people who have been speaking, email addresses, etc., so that you can get in touch. Equally, you can get in touch with us if you have questions afterwards. Um, Alison, thanks for mentioning supported internships. I think that was the one in the package of vocational routes that we probably hadn't quite touched on today. So that's really good to hear. And I know that we've got a city um, supported internships coordinator um, on the call too. So again, any questions around supported internships, uh, please get in touch with Alison or us um, and we can point you in the right direction. Thank you very much, both of you, for sharing the platform there. A very good tag team um, and some really good information. We now have um, our very own Laura Sherlock, who is going to share information about labour market information. And then we will have opportunity to get your views and opinions. So get your brains um, ready for speak after this. Over to you, Laura. Thank you. Yeah, morning, everybody. Um, I'm very conscious that you've all had a, a lot of information this morning, so I'll try and, and keep it brief. Um, but I did just want to take this opportunity to talk about labour market information, because you may remember over a year ago, Sahira sent out a, a survey to, as part of this Centre Community of Practice, and something that came out there quite strongly um, was the need for more relevant, appropriate and sort of easy to navigate labour market information that's focused at young people with SEND. Um, so we've been looking into this in the background and quite recently I had a presentation from Vicky who is a counterpart to us at the Black Country um, and she, they have developed a labour market information website which I think is really great um, but I wanted to share it with you today because um, your opinion has a lot more, more weight than my opinion but if it is something that we want to look at want to do 
then I'd love your feedback, uh, positive, negative or somewhere in between. So Claire, if you could just go to the slide with the video on, uh, it's right near the bottom. I, I did speak to the um, developers of the website yesterday, so I, I got them to record their little demo of it um, because they'll be able to talk it through a little bit better than me. It's about 10 minutes long and apologies for my talking in part of it. Um, but if we could uh, play that now, I think it's, is it playing already? Uh, not Claire. quite sure. Bear with me just a moment. Thank you. I'm just trying to restart it. There we go. Oh, we haven't got any sound. Claire, do you have it open already as the video on its own without the presentation? I don't at this current moment in time. Uh, it's the way that you shared your. Uh, it's, it's the way that you share your screen. If you unshare. And reshare again, you can share your sound. Yeah, there's a little button at the top of the share. Yeah. OK. Let's try this again. Apologies, everyone. Can you all hear now? Something yeah. In the top leg. Uh, use your future black country today. That will be replaced with whatever is the name of your own site. Uh, yeah. The blue bar, and we need to put a little banner on the top here. All of the pages are narrated. And so if somebody comes to the site and they want to uh, hear it spoken, then you can click on this button. And it will start to, to speak all of the content of this page. Um, it's using the Google narration tool, which means we can we can we can dynamically change it. So if we have if we changed any words in this paragraph, for instance, we just do the upgrade or the sorry the update to uh, the Google via the Google tool, and then it will read out the the modified version of that text. One feature that um, that Vicky and her colleagues wanted in the Black Country was a map showing the list of the largest employers in the Black Country and the top ten places of interest. And so this is this is the resulting map, which we can see from the map key at the bottom. So if I click on the largest companies, for instance. I will find here Tata Steel in Wolverhampton with the postcode with a short description and then the more details links off to the Tata Steel website. So that's the top 10 companies and then the top 10 places of interest. I click on any of them. That's this one. Do you know what that is? CVS. Oh no, that's not correct. Yeah, there we go. Red House Glass Corn in down in Stourbridge. Uh, the name, a picture the postcode description and so on. If there's a website, we'll put the website details there as well. Yeah. Now that was a feature that uh, Vicky and um, the people she works for, Black Country Consortium, wanted on the home page, just as a little, little kind of promo tool for, for the Black Country. Yeah. When you come across to the About page, that's just the description about the page. Again, this is all read out. Who is the site for? Why would you want to use it? what future developments uh, will we be looking at? And as Vicky's quite keen to 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 show with all the all the jobs held in the in the site database, these are all jobs which are she believes with her um, expertise are accessible to those uh, who fall into the send category. And um, but we put a traffic light system on the jobs, which I'll show you later. So if, if it's green, uh, you don't need any qualifications. If it's amber, you need some. And then if it's red, you need a formal qualification to do those uh, to do that job. Um, a little bit more information uh, about the Black Country version. And then coming down here just to show the primary features on, on, on the site. Where can you study after school? The local offer. I think you'll all be familiar with the local offer, local support services and so on and so on. Oh, at the bottom, as you can see there, we've got the careers and enterprise company logo, but then these two logos here can be replaced with lo logos that you want to put on. Yeah, so this is the Black Country Careers Hub. This is the Black Country Skills Factory. <clears throat> they can be taken down then and then replaced with one, two, three logos that you want to put on to promote yourself. Moving across to the sector page, what... Um, Vicky did. She she actually created. She did a lot of work on this. Um, Twenty one sectors 
and these are the 21 sectors that they consider important to the black country economy. Uh, when we've been having the conversations with other hubs, they're saying, can we add one or two more? And I'm saying, or we're saying, yes, you can. Um, you can do two things. One, you can add one or two more, uh, or you could uh, or you could remove one or two. If you don't think these 21 are appropriate to your area, then you could have them removed. Um, it's up to you. Um, but within within the the, um, the budget which has been allocated, we couldn't do another 10 or 20 um, uh, sectors. Uh, one, one or two have asked for the, the, the sector names to be changed to something which is more appropriate to their area. I can't remember off the top of my head which one. But within each sector, uh, there is a list of jobs associated with, with that sector. So as you can see here at the bottom of the page, these jobs here, admin assistant, data entry clerk, health records clerk, etc. These uh, are, are jobs to do with um, administration. And as you can see, they're all indicated amber as they're set out. So they all you, you require some kind of formal qualification to be able to do that to do that job. The other way of getting to jobs, so you get to jobs through sectors or you get to jobs by clicking on, on jobs. And this gives you the opportunity to do two filters. One is to filter by qualification level. So you can see these three uh, tick boxes. So if we uh, untick red, if we untick green, we're left only with those amber where you need some kind of uh, qualification. The other thing you can do with it is all the sectors are listed in this kind of word cloud. And so if we look at, for instance, retail sales and click on retail sales, all you'll have appear here, here are the jobs that Vicky's added, which are related to retail sales. And that's a toggle, a toggle on off. Moving across to the news section, this is your opportunity um, to add news stories uh, about send in your in your area. I think you need to unmute, Claire. We've we've lost sound. Uh, the news section, the news update. Oh, sorry, that was my fault. From your team, if they wanted to be the news editor, for instance, and then we can show you. And it's a very simple way of adding a story to to the website. Moving across onto the information hub, this is all of the information that the um, the Black Country pulled together uh, to do with um, send and the labour market information. And as you can see, there are 12 sections on here. I won't go through all 12 sections here today. But for instance, if we click on section three, which are training providers, you'll find out about some, some training providers. And of course, again, some of these are training providers who have a national footprint. And some are organizations which might might be national, but have a local center. So here you've got NACRO Sandal Center. Uh, NACRO vacancies in the Black Country, the Black Country Opportunities video, uh, NOVA training, and I'm, I'm not sure if NOVA are, are national or just uh, Black Country, and so on. But what we can do with each one of these entries, we can, you just give us the information um, on the template and we'll replace uh, whatever is Black Country specific uh, to make it Leicester and Leicestershire specific. And that would apply right across all of the all of these all of these uh, sections. One thing that I've omitted to tell you about jobs because we, we didn't actually home in on a particular job. So if I click on uh, ad, admin assistant, for instance, you will then get some information about what it's like to work as an admin assistant. I'll come back to the videos in a moment. Everything's narrated, but you have an overview of the job, the kinds of activities you would get up to. Uh, what's, what kind of organisation would take them on, what's the workplace like, the number of working hours, the kind of um, salary relevant to that job, and if qualifications are relevant. So that's, that's that. And back to the videos, some of these videos are generic and or national, and so they, they, would, they would apply in whichever region. Some are black country specific, so some jobs it might be we've got a uh, a promotional video from Sandwell College 
about that particular job and what they're doing about it. Again, you'd have the opportunity to provide us with any videos which are appropriate to your education institutions in, in your region uh, or the equivalent uh, with private sector training providers and so on and so on. We then um, link what is the, the labour market information through to real job opportunities. Now, this isn't a formal link between uh, in effect a public sector site and private sector providers of uh, jobs information. These are just examples. So for instance, here we've um, we've created a link uh, looking at any jobs for administrative assistance in the black country through to the Indeed uh, website, which is a national organization. The one beneath that is a similar search approach for this time to a website called Midlands Opportunities. So you would have the opportunity of, of um, uh, of uh, if I just click on administrative assistant, it takes you through to the uh, the Indeed site, and as you can see, uh, it's searching. Yeah, for there, we can stop it there if that's okay. Code, code which is shown there, Bilston WV4 WV14. Why have we picked that? For? Uh, thank you. Uh, I realised that was about that was longer than needed to be, but I wanted to get to the the end where it started to sort of show you that it links through to actual real life live jobs that are available now so for those young people that are ready sort of to move on we've this sort of you can do the full process with them research right through to application but um basically i just wanted to take this opportunity while we've got so many people together just to ask what any initial thoughts on it if is this something that you think as a community we could make use of especially if it links to sort of leicester and leicestershire information leicester and leicestershire jobs um, do you think it's rubbish? That's also fine. Um, and if you did like it, how would you use it? Um, yeah, just sort of throwing it out to you guys for for opinions, really. Oh, there's a hand up. Healy. Hi, yeah, I think with my Hi. learners that um, they face so many barriers, I'd be a bit reluctant to just send them through to Indeed because they do need that support. Um, so if there could be, you know, <clears throat> whether or not we could have live vacancies of disability confident employers or something like that, just so that it's yeah. just filtered out rather than being um, generic free for all, that would be my suggestion. I know there are sort of dis ability recruitment websites so instead of it being a d indeed it could be um those uh, types of sites in instead um but yeah that that's fine yeah i think that's relatively easy to to do cool deep just following on from that comment about disability confident employers we had a meeting with um, Rob Turnell from the Employment Hub last week and on that web on the job vacancies website um, we've asked for that filter to be added and I think he's done it that's specifically yeah. but for that the Employment Hub website that's good to we could definitely link through to them as well yeah uh, thank you Sue we could use it in a variety of ways I quite like the feature of um having a young person as a news editor, I thought that might be quite a nice little uh, experience for somebody as well, to a young person to be able to sort of submit stories and things for us and into there. Um, so to get it ready for September, if it is something that we wanted to do, we'd need to sort of give the go ahead to the developers in the next week or two. Um, if you didn't feel comfortable, uh, yes, Keely, I'll send the, the link to that website and to another one that's um, being used down in Northampton and you can have a look and see um, what you think of those. Um, yeah, we'd need to let the developers know in the next couple of weeks. Um, so if I don't get inundated with loads of negative comments, I'll probably look to explore it a little bit further and so we can get it sort of ready and developed and stuff for September. We would want to put in uh, colleges, providers, things that are relevant and local to us. So I may reach out to, to you all that are on this call to see if you want to be included as part of the uh, sort of development of that. Um, but I will leave it there. I'm con. Oh, hi, Mark. 
I can't just wanted to say, yeah, I thought it was uh, really enjoyed it. Really interesting. Uh, it's kind of all this stuff's kind of at the out outer edge of my knowledge with regard to apprenticeships, but I think it's really important going forwards. And I'm from Futures for Business, by the way. I'm not sure if there's anybody else on from Futures for Business, but um, you know we run the National Career Service across the East Midlands, and uh, I work for the Leicester Employment Hub on the on the team of the Leicester Employment Hub. Um, and yeah, in futures, we run lots of other similar kinds of contracts like NEAT and, and that kind of thing. But although they are in Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire, but um, within the business, we have a lot of knowledge around that kind of thing. So yeah, we would definitely, I think it's a great idea and we would definitely like to have um, some involvement in it. That's great. That sounds okay. Um yeah, absolutely. I'll um, drop my email in the chat and then anybody that does want to reach out to me, uh, please do. Just OK, thank you. If there's anyone also who can um, message Laura to say how they would use it, that would be really helpful to us um, because it would give us much more kind of backing to um, commit to the funds required. For yeah, if there's any sort of specific extra bits that are outside of that that link that you think would be useful, then it'd be great to to know that know that as well. Laura, are you able to put the links in now for yep. those sites so that people can have a look at them? Because we may not get the information out until the next few days, um, yep. even early next week. It might be when we get the recording and things out. So if you know you've got the uh, links and the email address for Laura here, so please feel free to just send stuff over before you've had the post event information. Just a forewarning to those that are on council systems, the black country one, uh, it doesn't work. It's blocked, so you have to use your phone. Um, but the future destinations one does, which is the same that one, but I've got those in now. Good warning, thanks. OK, so um, Last opportunity to have a say on this or anything else before I start um, winding us down, hopefully a little bit early. So, you know, give you guys a bit of time back. That chance to have a tea or a coffee that's still hot, that doesn't go cold while you're sitting there waiting or trying to drink it and being distracted by the work. OK, I'm going to take that as a cue for me to continue with the rest and finish off. So today we've covered mostly theme one um, and hopefully hearing about those different vocational pathways and how our young people would send can access those has been quite useful for you. If you do think of any questions or you you know got comments or want more information, please do get in touch with us. We will send out all of the information with contact details uh, by next week, hopefully after this meeting. We have this space now. I'll give about five to ten minutes for sharing transition support and resource recommendations. If anyone who's on here, I know you know um, we've got some providers and service offers um, on the call today. So if you have any activities, any uh, packages, any anything you want to share that might be useful to schools or families uh, please feel free to do so you can put it in the chat you can send it to us afterwards you can pop your hand up and talk about it now if you want you, you can have the floor for a minute or so um, so that's open now Sarah, just one uh, other thing it would be great to understand from anybody if you have something specific you'd like us to focus on next time. Um, it was really clear at the last meeting that we wanted something on apprenticeships and traineeships and T-levels. So if there is something that you feel is a, a gap, we can try and seek to, to plug that and uh, fill any information that you're looking for. Silence. <laughs> check the chat quickly. OK, we've got people starting to leave us in the chat. Um, that's OK. We will continue to work on the themes that we the four themes that we have and we will continue 
to find information and things that are helpful to you. What um, I would like to say is that they this is a forum that's open to anybody. So if you have students, parents, colleagues, friends who you think might be interested, please feel free to share the link when you receive it. Uh, we share it out with all the contacts that we have who are happy to attend, but we don't have you know connections with everybody and actually we are we don't have many students on the call so if you can share that that's fantastic if any of you have spoken today or have information that and we don't know you personally then please please feel free to connect with us let us know who you are we don't know everyone who's on the call all the time um, and that's okay that's fine we're happy to do this and leave it open for people to attend as they wish and that is about all that we wanted to say today. So last opportunity before I close for anyone to chat, we will remain on the call for a few minutes after I stop recording if anyone wants to stay and speak to myself or Laura. Lots of thank yous in the in the chats today. Thank you. I mean, thank you all for coming. We've had a really good group today. It's It's been great. We want to keep those numbers high so that we can share this information as widely as possible. When we do share the information after the meeting, again, please feel free to share that with colleagues and other people who you feel uh, may find it useful. Thanks, Alison. Lovely to see you all as well. All right, that is the end. I'm going to stop the recording in a moment and we will send out information soon. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Sahira. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Laura. Bye.